This is the disclaimer for Wildlife Control Consultant and Pest Geek Podcast with Living the Wildlife Podcast. Always follow national, state, provincial, and local laws when using pesticides and or other control methods to manage pests. Wildlife Control Consultant, LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, Wildlife Control Consultant, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife Podcast as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Hey, glad to have you along today. I hope you're doing well wherever you are uh, here in Montana. It's kind of a windy, windy day. Uh, yesterday was actually quite warm for Montana where we're at. We're at like 3,500 feet. And so it was 55 degrees yesterday, which is just amazing given that we've had some colder temperatures. So uh, clearly Montana hasn't figured out if we're going into winter yet. And we even had a little bit of rain, which we desperately need. Well, do take a few moments, if you could, to subscribe to our channel. And we'd love to have you ring that bell a little bit so you know what future updates for our podcast is. Uh, I publish weekly, so I deal with the vertebrate side of things. Uh, Franklin deals with pretty much everything else, and sometimes he sneaks over into my side and deals with vertebrates as well. But nevertheless, we hope you enjoy the the podcast here. We're two separate uh, podcasts. We both have our own, do our own thing here, and we're responsible, of course, for our own content. Do take a few moments as well, if you would, and reach out to me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Love to hear your comments and questions. Uh, do keep in mind, if you call me, uh, I may charge you for the consultation service, so I just want to be sure that's understood. I, I try to give out, I give out a lot of free information, but I have to find a way, of course, to pay for my liability insurance as well. So uh, do keep that in mind. So definitely reach out with some questions. If there's some simpler things that I can just sort of cut and paste and send to you, I will likely do that. But if you're calling, uh, I'm going to probably want to get some sort of payment after a few minutes. So uh, you can certainly do that. Be happy to do that. But understand that I do have some time constraints. Plus, there is a ton of information. I've been doing this for, what, a couple of years now. So uh, definitely search through uh, the podcast, do this, do a little search on our site, and you can probably find something that I have touched on before, because a lot of the questions, of course, uh, that you may have, other wildlife control operators have had as well. So it may have already been discussed, However, if you want something more personalized and nuanced and perhaps more in-depth research, perhaps you need me to ghostwrite something for you, by all means, reach out. Happy to do some of that stuff because that's kind of what I do. I don't do a lot of field work anymore, although I do some in my, my day job. But uh, most of my work now is primarily uh, researching things that other people simply don't have the time or the resources to access to try to really drill down into some things because there's a lot of people out there that can talk about techniques for catching things but they don't have the time or the resources to research things in the scientific literature or government documents and that sort of thing so we all have our place and certainly I have benefited from those who have done a lot of field work and of course my own field work and I'm talking with other wildlife control operators so enough about that do welcome your suggestions and comments and suggestions for interviews. If you have a product or service that you would like to start marketing, definitely reach out to us. No charge to you. We'd be happy to interview you because part of our interest, of course, is to present our audience additional information, new products, new services, the public. And we're happy to do that because we want to see this industry thrive and prove in professionalism so that we can serve the public uh, with the skills that you have in a proper manner that's environmentally responsible as well. So actually today's particular vodcast came from a question that I received from, from a viewer. Uh, so it kind of stimulated me. So, you know, I haven't really talked that much about chimneys. And so uh, I wanted to put together some basic concepts about chimneys today. So that's today's topic and hope, hope that you enjoy it. So uh, let's, why don't we get started? So a chimney, I mean, it's not a complicated entity or device. Here we have a picture of a 
house, a two-story house, and notice how this particular chimney works in that you have two flues. Let me kind of put my cursor up here. We have two flues here, and you'll notice, whoops, I gotta go back. We have two flues, each flue under modern conditions, although I had had a flu where the, the two flus actually merged, that's a separate thing. So that's, let me sort of pause here before I get too far ahead of myself. When you're dealing with older buildings, and by older, maybe back in the 20s, I think the house that I dealt with was actually built in the late 1800s, you have to keep an open mind about what you're going to find. So typically, Chimneys are standalone structures, and that is they're designed to, when they're built, that they need to carry their own weight and have their own foundation and footing so that they're not relying on the house. You're saying, well, Stephen, but it's right in the middle of the house. Yes, but the house is not holding up the chimney, or at least it's not supposed to. The chimney is to be its own entity. That's why if you ever see a building burn down, a lot of times you'll see the chimney standing. Okay, The chimney is its own entity where the rest of it's all gone. Of course, obviously the brick's not going to burn unless it gets really hot, but the chimney is its own entity. So we need to treat it as such. So when you're doing an inspection, you have to think about the house and the chimney is its own entity inspection on its on itself and you have to keep that in mind now there are instances where maybe people cut corners you know this can certainly happen when people are sort of building their own houses on their own they're not necessarily following code maybe code enforcement wasn't very strong so i just want you to be aware that you have to definitely keep this in mind that things can happen. So don't get arrogant, let the structure teach you, but there are certain things that are supposed to be done under modern building practices. So each one of those flues under modern circumstances are to be self-contained on their own, so they're not gonna be merging, okay? So what that means is, is we have one flue here, so we have a chimney with two flues, and these are, tile based and they're basically long sections of orange tile and they're stacked on each other with mortar in between them and they go all the way down because that helps protect that helps the heat that she shields the brick from the heat that comes from the burning fuels that are being used in that particular that are exhausted in that particular chimney so chimneys have a very important role they're exhausting toxic gases to the outside so they're not poisoning the homeowners as well as in the case of certain fire mechanisms they're trying to retain the heat so you don't burn the house down okay pretty straightforward but this particular chimney that's designed here you'll have a fireplace on the first floor and that would be the flue on the right and then you have the the furnace in the basement which is exhausting into the flue on the left that is a very common set up in many homes. You may see multiple flues where maybe there's going to be a third flue, maybe there's a fireplace on the second floor or the third floor or whatever the case may be. But as a rule of thumb, each flue is to handle one device. Sometimes you'll find a hot water heater and a furnace exhausting into the same flue. You know, again, things change but typically the older the building is the more screwy things can become you know things that are built since the 1950s I would say if I just had to throw a number out uh, you're gonna have a lot more standard standardization but you know in the 20s late 1800s oh you can who knows what you're gonna get all right so keep that in mind and why is this important so that when you're inspecting them you know that under normal circumstances, they are standalone. And you, when you inspect these particular flues, you'll know if there's a sound in the fireplace, well, you know that it's not in the left flue because that's gonna be related to the right flue. So knowing which flue goes with which uh, appliance, fireplace, furnace, is important that you're gonna to have to try to figure out. Down at the bottom, we have some cleanouts. These are the black boxes, squares you see at the bottom. Not every chimney has these. 
So typically these would be for when people were burning. They would, when they did a cleaning, when they had the chimney flue, the chimney, uh, chimney sweep would be able to come down and pull out the debris from the cleaning of those particular flues. <clears throat> Again, often they're not very used. Of course, oil and gas are obviously significantly cleaner than fireplaces today. So a lot of times, a lot of people aren't burning wood anymore. If they do, it's maybe very rarely. Uh, and so these are rarely ever opened or used. However, sometimes an animal comes down the chimney and they come out through the clean out section or perhaps the damper on the first floor. So this is what this these are things you're going to have to learn now to be clear this is a masonry chimney we're only going to talk about masonry chimneys today there are metal chimneys but we're not going to talk about those today so we're just going to be dealing today with the masonry chimneys so bear with me as we get so now we have a diagram here so as i said before each masonry chimney is supposed to be a standalone entity so notice we have here at the bottom we have the footing notice we have a concrete slab here so that's sort of carrying the weight of all of this brick and flue tile on this particular chimney and here we have it sort of diagrammed out for you there's that flue liner those are the orange i call them orange some of you may have a different coloration for them but these are the orange flue tiles that carry that can re resist the flame or the heat from exhausting fire in that particular chimney to protect the brick. And these are stacked on top of one another. Go farther down and you'll have the smoke chamber. This is the area where it's above the damper. The damper, of course, allows the smoke going from the fireplace or the hearth up into the smoke chamber, then out into the chimney. Typically speaking, when we're dealing with raccoons, for example, when raccoons are in chimney, uh, look at the picture to the left. They are going to be behind the damper on this little, what we call smoke shelf. And that's where they're going to be residing. And then the female is going to climb up and down. So she climbs by pressing her hands or her feet against the flue tile and kind of shimmying her way up. And of course, sometimes the mortar joints I have a, they ooze out a little bit and that can give her some footholds too as she's climbing up but typically she's just sort of pressing out takes the young uh, I think about six weeks before they are big enough to be able to climb out on their own to follow uh, their mother so basically that's something to understand so when we're looking at this flute this this chimney uh, the smoke chamber Notice the damper, you're going to push, typically push the damper up to open it up and the young and the raccoons are going to be behind that. So we're not going to do a whole lot of talking about that today, but be careful when you are opening dampers. You want to make sure you're wearing your PPE. Sometimes those, damp sometimes those dampers are very brittle because they haven't been used for ages and the steel wears out or perhaps they were used a lot in the early years of the house and then over time rust is beginning to degrade the damper and so if you push it sometimes there's rust there and it's not moving very well because it's it's kind of spinning on an axis and you're pushing it up and you're pushing too hard or maybe there's debris behind it and all of a sudden you crack it or you break it that's that could be bad and sometimes you'll have debris falling down and all that dust Make sure you have to be prepared for various eventualities when you're working with dampers. So uh, probably for another discussion, but I just want to give you a heads up here. Uh, be careful and think about how things can go wrong. Because if you get a squirrel in there and open that damper, sometimes the squirrel will jump out. And they always will jump out into the living room where you have everything, where the client has everything white. So you have this sooted squirrel running around the living room, soiling all kinds of stuff. So uh, and that'll raise your blood pressure, if nothing else. If nothing else does, that will certainly do it. So here, so when we're looking at this particular picture, here we have an example of the chimney cleanout. Now this one, I'm calling this one a fireplace cleanout because it's right below the floor of the fireplace's hearth. And so here we have an example. I did a little diagram. So here's our damper. Notice how the clean out, there's usually a little cover here 
excuse me, I gotta go back up every time I click it, it moves on me. The firebox, this is where the where you'd be putting the wood for your fireplace, and sometimes you'll see a little doorway at the bottom of the floor there, and if this is where people would take the ash and sweep the ash into this box and it would drop down into the basement and you would get it in the firebox clean out. You can see my little blurry image here to the left. Here's an example of that. One of those clean out things. However, sometimes you will see what I call this sort of situation where there's a chimney clean out as opposed to a firebox clean out. Now notice the difference here. If you have ash in the firebox, you're going to have to sweep that up, put it into a container and carry it out through your house. Where this one, the when a chimney sweep is working, all of that debris comes from the chimney down to the chimney clean out where there's nothing from the firebox that's going to get down there. Different chimneys are designed in different ways, so you have to keep that in mind. If you're looking at this one, you're not going to have an animal down here in this firebox clean out because it would have had to have come from the smoke chamber down to the firebox, then out through the firebox clean out. Very unusual for that to happen. Typically the animal would come out into the living room unless maybe there was a glass screen here that prevented the, the animal from getting into the, into the living space of the house proper. However, with this one, it can happen because sometimes the, rac the raccoons may live here or the raccoons may come all the way down to the chimney clean out. And sometimes animals will come all the way down like squirrels. Squirrels can't climb that flue tile. That flue tile is too smooth for them to grip. Um, and you say, well, I've had situations where they're able to climb up. If that's the case, typically it's because the mortar joints, the mortar in between those flue tiles is oozed out enough to give them footholds and often there may be sections of the flue tile that are actually missing so they can grab the brick because squirrels can climb brick so there are instances but typically speaking when a squirrel goes down a chimney it's not coming back out without some sort of help so that's when you'll find clients who will say well i'm hearing noises in the chimney uh, you know, and I, you ask, well, how many days has it been going on? Well, it's been going on about three days. Well, that squirrel's pretty much near the end of its life. Uh, three days is kind of my rule. Now, there are other exceptions. Sure, if it's warm enough, maybe there was some rain where it was able to get some water. But as a rule, three days, that squirrel's history. And so if you're calling, if they're calling you on the fourth day, so yeah, we had noises and then it stopped. Because then they'll call you, if they'll, they probably won't call you on day four, they'll call you in a few weeks maybe when they're, if there's an odor. And there's not always an odor because it depends on how that chimney is drafting. Okay. Nevertheless, understand that these are some different designs of how that chimney can work. So if you're going into the basement and looking at the chimney, at the, at the clean out, you have to ask yourself, is this a firebox clean out or is this a chimney client clean out? Or there are, I guess there would be instances where it could be both, where maybe there's another opening between the firebox and so that maybe there's a, an opening between the firebox and the chimney clean out so that they're both joined at that particular point. So you've got to figure that out. So keep an open mind, go online, look at some diagrams of the different chimneys and be aware that you, things can be different as you're looking at them, right? So you can't just simply don't rush to judgment, as I tell people. Uh, be careful, keep an open mind as you're looking at this, and so knowing that there's some different options. Well, here's an example of chimney swifts. If you open up your clean out, and this is an example, I see all this pile. This is actually feces, and if you look carefully at it, it's a little hard to see with this picture, but you'll notice some feathers, and chimney swifts, of course, are birds that live their cavity dwellers and they like to live in chimneys and they are migratory so they're not going to be there all year round and so they are a federally protected bird so don't kill them don't harm them wait for them to leave and then you can put the chimney cap on the chimney but you'll often if you're disturbing them they'll give you this really 
it'd be like a rawr, rawr, rawr. It's, when I first heard it the first time it scared the living bejesus out of me I had no idea it was like a grinding so- sound and I had no I had no idea what I was dealing with it scared the living daylights out of me so here I am I'm sticking my head inside the firebox and then I'm opening up the damper when I opened up the damper that's when the bird started doing that rawr, 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 ground it, uh, grinding noise and then I looked up and saw a bird and I thought it I felt like an idiot so don't be me uh, definitely keep in mind that if you're hearing that kind of noise that's very likely chimney sweeps protected species tell your client they just need to be patient you can maybe look at some of the other chimney flues and see if any um, any birds are using those if they're not you may want to do a chimney cap on those but make sure you're not trapping any birds okay that's a federal crime don't do it plus chimney swifts are pretty cool pretty cool animals and if you just wait till probably late august i believe in most northern states maybe into early september they'll be gone and you're and you're good to go just cap cap the chimney okay so uh there may be a need for a cleaning because of they building nests on the flu you have to sort of have that kind of conversation with your client I would just be very cautious. This is something where we have to be very careful about safety with chimneys because chimney fires are a real deal. And you also want to remember that there's toxic fumes that will be going up this chimney. You don't want anything that's going to interfere with that exhaust because those gases can come into the house. Now, typically with a fireplace, people are going to notice because of all the acridness of the smoke that they're being exposed. But when we're dealing with things like natural gas, if you have a natural gas furnace, they may not smell anything that's burning. So all those car because carbon monoxide doesn't have an odor. And if it's burning and that gas is not able to escape or not enough of the gas is able to escape, you'll get back up and then it can come into the house and kill the clients. Carbon monoxide gas, you can listen to my other presentation on carbon monoxide, extraordinarily toxic. So you need to be careful and, and have, I would encourage everyone to become friends with a chimney sweep. Find someone in the area that you like, that you trust, and develop a working relationship with them. And you can probably pass business on to them, things that are outside of your ability, uh, and certainly out of your qualification scale, and they'll probably hopefully pass things on to you when it comes to wildlife. And you can have a, a symbiotic relationship with one another. But you want to be very careful if there's anything interfering with that chimney. If you're looking down that chimney and things don't look right, uh, you need to be telling your client and documenting that because chimneys are serious, serious business and they're chimney fires. Uh, we had a friend of ours that had a, a chimney fire in their house and it burned their house down. And uh, it, this is serious business. So uh, whether it be for fire or whether it be for toxic gas, do be careful when you're dealing with this and document yourself. So as I said before, here we have an example of where the raccoon den with leaf bedding is, okay? And here's that damper I'm talking about. So you can push that damper up and that's gonna lift out. That would allow the gas, the, the smoke from the fireplace into the smoke, sh smoke chamber and then out through the chimney. And you will have to learn how to take this damper off. There's often a cotter pin here. So you need to have extra sets of cotter pins. And sometimes those cotter pins are so wedged in there You'll have to cut them off. So a pair of <clears throat> vice grips, hammer, pliers, and try to knock that out. And then make sure you have fresh ones so you can put a new cotter pin. And again, be careful because this metal is often very, very brittle. So be careful before you do anything too radical. And I want to, again, encourage that PPE. You should be thinking about what happens if I open this up in a cloud of of a soot and things are dumping down into the fireplace and then flowing out into the living room how much of that stuff's contaminated with raccoon roundworm or whatever so you need to be thinking about things like that before you do anything a lot of guys will have blankets that they'll lay down you may want to put some plastic sheeting up along the 
the front face of the fireplace just to make sure that dust is done. And you want to do things slowly and methodically if you're going to be working on that. But again, those are issues for other issues, uh, other episodes coming up. So just be careful if you're doing this on your own. Now, before you even open the damper, I generally recommend people to inspect chimneys from the outside and from the top first. But before we do that, I want to give you an example of how dangerous putting a ladder up on a chimney can be. See how tall this particular chimney is. This is what would be called an unsupported chimney. Now, as I said before, chimneys need to be able to stand on their own. Okay, and this chimney clearly is. But if you're, they're not designed for you to be putting weight up against it. So you're going to be putting your 32 foot ladder, maybe a 40 foot ladder, depending on how big it is. When you're putting that up against the chimney itself, can it handle the weight? Because you don't know how good that mortar is. That ch chimney there is pretty old, and you can even see that there's a brace on it that goes from you know, five or six layers down on that chimney, and then it has a, a metal brace around it that anchors into the roof itself. You putting weight on that, that could collapse. And if you're climbing that and that chimney gives way, you're going to be in a world of hurt. So I, you need to be very careful dealing with chimneys. I would not suggest putting your the weight of your chimney, weight of your, uh, excuse me, the weight of your ladder up a chimney like this. That is just way, way too dangerous. And so you'll need to be thinking about that, and talking maybe with the chimney swift, talking with roofers perhaps about how you would navigate getting up to there. Maybe you have to buy, get a ch uh, cherry picker and to get up there to look. I, I don't know, but you're gonna have to be very careful. So don't just simply assume that a chimney is safe. Oh, it's brick and everything. No, 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 no. Don't assume that at all. Now, and so you'd wanna look at how does that chimney look like it's in good repair? How much of that's being supported or helping to be reinforced, I should say, for lateral pressure? Is it against the house? And so just be very careful and think about that. Should I be putting my ladder on this chimney or should I put it on the house and then access the chimney by another way? Just putting that out there to think because obviously there's a lot of variables that you're going to have to think about when doing that. So here we are at the chimney top. This is called the crown. Here we have that flue tile, that orange flue tile I was telling you. Here, this one looks a little bit more reddish, okay? But reddish, orange, however you want to call it, this is the flue tile I was referring to that protects the brick from the heat of the exhaust. The crown is this concrete metal cap on the top of the chimney. That crown is supposed to protect the brick below from moisture, from rain, because rain is devastating to brick and chimneys because what happens is is water will get between the flue tile and the concrete and then seep down and then of course it freezes and then it begins to crack and begin to degrade the chimney this is a beautiful looking crown you always want to cap all chimneys with a professionally manufactured cap. And the reason for that is, is that that chimney cap helps protect that chimney from rain damage because it helps reduce water exposure between the flue tile and the brick. So it, think of it as an integrated system and it helps extend the life of the chimney. Plus it prevents a lot of wildlife from getting into the chimney as well as, plus there's leaves and debris and other things. And so it is quite advantageous for most chimneys. There are exceptions, but for most chimneys, they should have a professionally manufactured chimney cap and I'm recommending stainless steel. Now what happens over time is you get these cracks and this is obviously the crown is quite degraded and you can see the gaps in how the concrete has been breaking away. So over time, this is gonna destroy that particular chimney. I want to just turn you on to a couple products here, Crown Coat and Crown Seal. There are, these are products where you can repair the crown of the chimney and you don't have to be, you know, a concrete expert and what have you to use these particular products. I'm just suggesting them to you. There are some crowns that will need professional rebuilds. Talk to the manufacturers here, but for a lot of crowns that are in the early phases of decay, 
these particular products can be useful for you to make a little extra money while you're up there and repair that repair that crown while you're there. A lot of your clients would love to have it. Uh, this is something I learned from uh, some people within a national association I'm associated with. So definitely check this out. I, there are YouTube videos on it. Uh, I am not an expert in this particular area by a long shot, but there are other, but it's from what I've seen, I think even I could do it. And if I could do it, I am guarantee you'll be able to do it. So I, these are things that I didn't know when I was in business, okay? So, and I'm not sure they were even available when I was in business. I think it required a lot more, but so some of the technology has definitely improved. Check it out and you can have another re revenue stream for your particular business. If you're inspecting chimneys, of course, you wanna make sure that the, the, co the client may say, oh yeah, we have a chimney cap on our flu. Uh, how what's the quality of it you see here they have a chimney cap so it's helping protect the chimney from rain but is it protecting it from animals well clearly no all right and plus it's not even stainless steel it's galvanized painted metal which is going to rust so that is certainly something that is going to be a particular issue and that's what happens when galvanized is used over time. Notice it's missing a roof. It's not the best shot, but you can tell that's all rusted out and it's missing a roof. This is why you're going to hear me always say stainless steel. Copper is another version. The amount of money you save by using galvanized, it's not worth it for the client. Only a client who knows he's going to be moving out in a few years would ever want to buy a, a galvanized cap. And it's just not a it's not a bargain. It, if, if you're going to use something, stainless steel, they're often warranted for life and one and done. And they're going to last a whole lot longer. So why not, why not use it for just often, it's often just a, a mere small percentage, maybe 10 to 15% more expensive, you know, 20, $30 more expensive. That's nothing. When you consider what is what you're charging to get up there in the first place, your labor is the majority of the cost, not the product. Your client needs to understand that. So be careful. Try to use properly. So here we have an example. We're looking down the chimney here. Not all chimneys are straight. Sometimes chimneys are curved, and so you're not going to be able to see all the way down if you take a flashlight. Sometimes if you look down from the top, you're going to see some eyes peering back up at you. <laughs> But many times you won't see that because they're curved and you're not going to be able to see all the way down into the smoke shelf. But notice we have our flue tiles. Remember I said the mortar is in between each one of these stacked flue tiles. Now this looks beautiful. It's clearly a relatively new chimney, but it's in excellent, excellent condition, right? You can just look at it. It looks beautiful, right? You're going to see situations where you're not going to see things that are beautiful. You're going to see things like, oh my gosh, this this flue tile is off center. You may be cracked, you may be missing. I reached down into one chimney and pulled out a brick that was blocking half of the, the half of the flue. And I just reached down and grabbed it. And so, because that's not supposed to be there, for some reason it fell down and got wedged and was blocking half of the flue. So, do take that opportunity. You don't have to be a chimney professional to be able to tell your client, hey, I see some issues with your chimney and refer the person. Make sure that's documented on your contract or your inspection sheet that you're telling people so that way they can't come back to you and say, you didn't tell me that you know my house was in danger and blah, 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 blah. You don't want that on your liability insurance. And plus, it's just not kind. I mean, if you find a problem with someone's house, you should tell them about it, even if you're not hired to do that particular task or you're not qualified to do that particular task. As I tell people, you don't have to be an orthopedic to look at an x-ray and see if the if a bone is you know completely broken through. You don't have to be an, a doctor to say, hey, the arm is broken, right? Uh, we're not supposed to diagnose, but it you know, we're not blind either, okay? Now, you may not know the extent of the problem. Maybe it's not a big deal but you want to be sure you let the client know that you saw something. And I just think that makes you more professional. And I think many clients would appreciate it, particularly if they know you're not trying to sell them something additional for yourself. Uh, they, they're more likely to believe it. Take photographic evidence if you're able to take photographs of it and, and let the person see that. Uh, that's just, again, if you're, you should always be charging for your inspections, definitely give them a heads up. But this, 
chimney ob chimney flue obviously looks beautiful okay but you can see the stacking and that's what I want you to understand about that so how do we secure these chimneys well this is not the way to secure the chimney I want to be very clear about that this is wrong don't do this don't do this ever don't trust the client to say oh well we're gonna, we're never going to use that fireplace that flue anymore don't believe them the danger with this is that if you're if, is, is a couple of things if you're dealing with a gas furnace gas furnaces throw off a lot of moisture and if that moisture condenses on this quarter inch hardware cloth in cold weather it can freeze and force those gases back inside the house second what happens if you have a, a snowstorm and snow and like an ice storm and it builds up across the top of that and blocks the gases and forces that back in the house additionally that does not stop rain damage to the chimney so there's a lot of reasons why you should not be doing this don't ever get yourself caught involved doing that at all if you're going to be so confident that that chimney is never going to be that flu not chimney excuse me that flu is not to be used why not just seal it off take something solid and seal it off and then i would mark in the fire that 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 fireplace or that flue area and i would mark this has been closed sealed off no longer in use and have that documented up the wazoo and i'd be nervous about even doing that you have, remember when you have liability insurance you have to be cautious about the idiots that you're dealing with clients may not be always lying to you but they may think that they're never going to do something and then they sell the house and someone else does it you need to be thinking about what that people are always looking for places to sue our industry is now going to be coming more under scrutiny as we become more mature and lawyers run out of places to sue be careful don't do this this is uh, my understanding is this is doing this is illegal uh, don't don't do this at all this is better now I want you I want to explain what you're seeing in the right hand side of this picture this was a test I was doing to make sure uh, that I had that there were no raccoons living in this particular flute so this is completely temporary so Stephen you said never to seal that yes but notice I'm using duct tape this is temporary and notice I'm doing this during the summertime so I'm not worried about things freezing here this was something I used to see if there was a raccoon coming in and out of this particular flute because I couldn't tell whether there was something there or not. And so I basically did this temporary so I would find out it could come back in a couple days. If things were ripped off, then obviously the raccoon was still there. What I would do today is a suggestion I heard from some of my colleagues. I don't know if I should name them, but it's not my idea, but they call it a... Uh, a wildlife movement indicator is the phrase that they use which is kind of clever and what they do is they take duct tape and they create a grid over the flu and just tape it down and that way the animal if a raccoon's coming through a raccoon just tears the duct tape away or sometimes you'll see fur caught on the tape itself and that'll help you identify what the animal is but that way there's no screen used at all you just make a grid now how how big should the openings be I would probably not make the openings bigger than six inches uh, maybe down to four because a raccoon's just gonna claw through it or whatever but uh, that's a movement indicator to tell you whether anything is still moving in and out of that I just couldn't tell the devices you see at the left are I call them raccoon screens you might see them something different the reason why they would be used you say Stephen I thought you wanted a chimney cap to protect against rain you do but sometimes the the caps that have a roof on them are too close together and then they clash so you're not able to fit them together so or you could bend them but it's just that's kind of tacky but this is an easy way of at least providing some animal protection even though it doesn't provide rain protection when you're using these particular products you'll need to be sure you have at least two or three inches of flue tile above the surface of the crown so that you can screw uses uh, friction screws uh, into the flue tile to attach it and when you screw it in you want them screwed in good and strong and you want to grab that cap and then kind of put some weight into it because you don't want that blowing off and killing somebody 
okay? So you wanna make sure things are secure. If you don't have enough flue tile, they have legs that they can attach and the legs will slide down into the chimney. You can actually see the legs on the one on the left. One of them's right over here in the upper left-hand corner. And that is some, those are legs that are used when your flue tile isn't tall enough. Now, I don't recommend these highly. Sometimes your clients can't afford the other things. I would recommend something along these lines with a multi-flue. A little bit more work to be sure because you're using an adhesive and you're going to be drilling into the crown and anchoring, anchoring the flue with some concrete screws. Now I've I've been to I knew a chimney sweep who only used the adhesive. That I think is a mistake because the manufacturer at that time always said screws and adhesive. Okay, so the follow the manufacturer's advice. I'm just, you know, he said, well, I've been working for so many years. I've never had one come off. That may be great. If you are using just the adhesive, and I'm not recommending that, but if you are just using the adhesive, make sure you're using enough adhesive so that some of that adhesive is coming up through the the cap holes, the, there'll be holes along the base of that cap. So that way some of that adhesive will harden through the hole to help anchor that into place, okay? But I'm telling you, you wanna be using some tap cons. There's some screws that you're gonna be using as well as the adhesive. You probably wanna be using both. And that way you're able to cover all the flues at once. There are certain height restrictions about how high above the flue that, that cap needs to go. So talk to your cap manufacturer about how, how, how much clearance you should have. And that's gonna be very important for you uh, to make sure when you're measuring because obviously the taller the cap is the more money it's going to be so make sure you measure properly because the distance is measured from the top of the flute tile to the ceiling of the cap and you can see the single caps here again there's friction screws uh, by quality whenever you're whenever you're doing work so in terms of some informational resources your chimney cap suppliers are excellent places to get information I mean, who better would know about chimney caps than the people that actually build them and have been involved in them. So I'm certainly going to suggest these as additional sources of information. You know, High C is a company that's been very good to the wildlife control industry. Uh, so I'm just kind of giving them a shout out again. I don't make money from any of these particular groups here. Uh, so I would definitely reach out to them. They've done a lot of, they've created a lot of products specifically because of wildlife control industry has asked them to and I, we asked them once when they were coming to a national conference we said why are you here and they said well we come here because we get ideas for new products here so they recognized that the wildlife control industry was a very small market for them but they appreciated it because wildlife control operators are a creative bunch and they would come with a bunch of ideas and they would produce products to satisfy those particular needs. Some of the vent covers for roofs have, were designed because of people from wildlife control industry talking to them. Chimney King is another organization. They have a lot of very interesting and creative caps. You might want to check them out as well. In terms of chimney repairs, when I talked about that crown seal, that's from chimneysaver.com. You can check them out and they'll have information. Again, there's some YouTube videos of course and how to do those crown repairs so i just want to end with a warning again you know because i'm a nervous nelly and i just know that people sometimes get a little ahead of themselves and they have a lot more confidence than perhaps they need to realize you have to understand there's a lot of risks working around chimneys i mentioned one about chimney collapse you need to be careful you're also dealing with ladders you have to think about ladder safety you have to think about exposure to creosote and any of the animal dangers when you're dealing with animals inside of a chimney as well and the issue of personal property damage and your health be careful out there uh, again i'm stephen van tassel wildlife control consultant you've been listening to the podcast living the wildlife i uh, hope you enjoyed it definitely take a few moments join us on facebook join our facebook page join the revolution as franklin calls it love to hear from you you can reach me at wildlife control consultant at gmail.com wildlife control consultant at gmail.com would love to hear from you your ideas suggestions for new topics perhaps you have a business or a product that you'd like to market to our audience definitely reach out to me there's no charge for that again wildlife control consultant at gmail.com would love to hear from you you know criticisms or comments either way i would be glad 
to hear it, uh, although I love hearing praise, as we all do, because it strokes our ego. What else is no? Well, I hope you enjoyed this particular presentation. We'll be doing some more work on chimneys and dealing with metal chimneys and perhaps some of the laws as I'm able to dig them up. <clears throat> and again, this is living the wildlife. Why? Because we want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. Take care, everyone.